I am uh, pleased to welcome uh, a guy I met in 1977. I was an 18 year old kid with a, a media pass from the Angels. They were playing the only team that matters to me, the Red Sox, and this guy was one of their pitchers. And as I'm walking onto the field, scared to death that all my heroes were there, Fergie Jenkins was the first one to come up to me and say, hey, camera. And we started talking cameras. And honest to God, we've been friends for longer than we care to admit, Fergie. Fergie yeah, you're welcome. right. Yeah. I was into <laughs> collecting cameras back then. Uh, I had a lot of Nikons, uh, so many different lenses. I used to take a lot of pictures of the horses I was raising and also the dogs that uh, I ended up field trying them, field trying a bunch of dogs that I had. Yeah, it was um, it was crazy because I don't know if you remember this or not, but um, you guys kept me, you and Dewey and and uh, uh, Rice kept me in the in the dugout for the whole game, which obviously we can't do anymore. But you kept calling guys over. You called like Boomer Scott over. Hey, protect him. We want Popeye to see this guy sitting in the dugout. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Don that Zimmer. Was, that yeah. was that was fun. That was. He, he didn't know what was going on anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> kind of manager he was. Oh, Popeye, he, he was a character. He was a character. Hey, Fergie, um, let's talk about um, when you came up with the Phillies, uh, you pitched in Connie Mack Stadium, obviously. Um, the ballparks back then obviously were compact. They were on a postage stamp of a lot. And how was it different? Because uh, you actually came in, in into being as a, as a star pitcher when, when the cookie cutters came into being in the 60s and the early 70s. How was it different pitching in like Forbes Field or, or Comiskey or, or uh, any of the smaller parks as opposed to the vet in Philadelphia or, or one of the bigger ballparks, you know, Bush and St. Louis? Well, you, you, we had to go over the hitters prior to the game. Uh, we probably starting four pitchers on the staff, and then either you had to, one or two catchers, and we'd uh, – go over uh, certain uh, lineups. Uh, it all depends if, uh, if it was a left-handed pitcher, right-handed pitcher, the lineups they had. And we would def defense uh, the opposing team according to what the manager wanted. And at the time, we had Gene Block with the Phillies. And when I got traded to the Cubs, Leo DeRoche for that seven years with him, almost the same thing on a, on a daily basis. With Kenny Holson pitching or Bill Hands, myself, or Rich Nye, depended on – the opposing pitcher, and your staff. And uh, we defensed uh, the, the, that team against uh, – we're playing the, in that series, a four-game or, or a three-game series. Did you, uh, um, did you feel any animosity towards the Phillies when they traded you? Because, you know, it, it, for the Cubs, you know, you and the Rhino deal from the Phillies was like – it just blew away the uh, Ernie uh, – you know, Lou Brock for Ernie Brolio. They got two for – basically two for one – two Hall of Famers for one, you know, you and uh, Rhino. Did you have any animosity towards the Phillies or, or anything like that? Uh, no, not really. You know, I, I try my winningest record. I'm like 26 and nine against the Phillies <laughs> as a starter uh, because I knew these guys. I, I played yeah. against them uh, all spring trainings from Callison, Demeter, Dick Allen, uh, you name the infield, uh, Bobby Wine, uh, along with Amaro, Tony Taylor. Uh, there were so many guys that I knew how to pitch them. Uh, and I probably, to that effect, had an opportunity to really, really uh, uh, win a lot of ball games. Our video went out on you. But, uh, yeah, also, I know. I just seen so. it. It's just low battery. <laughs> oh, low battery. Um, Dick Allen, he could hit the ball farther than just about anybody, right? Yeah, he was pretty powerful. Uh, Never lifted weights. I've never seen him uh, pick up a weight, but he used like a 38 to 40 ounce bat. And Jeez. if he made contact with the ball, it was going a long way. Well, he there's there's a few players in baseball. You and I have been we I've been watching baseball 50 years. You a little bit longer. Um, there are a few guys when they come up to bat, and when they make contact, Jim Rice was one. There was that sound that no other guy had. You knew it, the ball was going to go hard somewhere. Oh yeah, uh, in, in the American League. It was probably Killebrew, uh, George Scott, uh, geez, um, Allison with the, the Twins, Dick Allen in the National League, Willie Mays, McCovey, uh, Willie Stargell, uh, Jim Ray Hart. Certain guys, when the crack of the bat was, was sounded, you knew that ball was going a long way. You didn't have to, to turn around to know where it was going. You just wave your hand to the umpire and need another ball. <laughs> Okay, that's going to lead me into the story that you have told me before. 
Tell the people about 1969 and the start of the season and Willie Mack. Well, season started, we, we opened up the season in San Francisco and I lose to Marichal, something like three to one, two to one. And McCovey hit a ball out of, uh, out of the stadium there, which, uh, I mean, they had no fences back then. I mean, they were so long. It's, it was incredible. Candlestick Park. Uh, it wasn't bordered in like it is now. Uh, and since then, uh, he hit a ball to right center field past the uh, flagpoles, probably 500 feet. The end result, I lose the ball game. We uh, have to play the Western Division three times, so they got to come to, to Chicago. He got a couple of key hits. Unfortunately, I, I lost another ball game, probably to Gaylord Perry starting. We go back out to the West Coast in September. We're at the Jack Tar Hotel, my roommates are Ernie Banks. We we're waiting for our luggage to get the trip delivered to the to the hotel room and the phone rings. And I'm the closest one to the phone. I picked the phone up. I said, uh, yeah, who is it? And Ernie wanted to, to know at the same time. He said, find out who it is. I said, well, who is this? He said, it's, it's the Maitre D from downstairs. Your car is here waiting for you. I said, I didn't order a car. He said, well, the car's for Mr. Jenkins. He said, uh, Mr. McCovey wants to make sure you get to the ballpark on time. <laughs> Which uh, I ended up paying. It was a Cadillac limo. A bunch of us piled into the car, about four or five guys, and we went to Candlestick Park that night. <laughs> well, McCovey, that year, 69, he was hitting everybody. I mean, nobody was, nobody was safe from Willie Mack that year. I mean, he just oh. tore up spring training and just kept going all year long. He had one of those oh. dream years. Yeah, he had, a, he had an off to the year. You know, I, I think that that particular night, I end up telling Randy, honey, tell him what's coming. If, if, if you tried to outfox him, he's going to get base hits. But I told him what's coming. I think it was something I played in his, in his mind. And unfortunately, I think he had a couple of pop-ups in the infield and a ground ball. I, he went 0 for 3 that night against me. <laughs> so you kind of got him back for the limo gag. Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah, that's see, that's the thing. The stories that come out from players of my era when I was growing up, some of the stuff you really don't want to repeat on, on the air or anything, but that, they are some like that one. That's a classic story. And um, I've got some questions here from some, uh, some fans. Um, what did you think of Gene Mock? I mean, was he – you weren't there. You, were you there at all in 64 with the collapse, or were you still in the minors? No, I was in, in AAA. I was in Arkansas in, in uh, 64. But I had three spring trainings, 62, 63, 64, before I got traded in 65, uh, basically to uh, the Chicago Cubs. So I had him in the spring. Uh, he used to stand in the outfield and watch the pitchers run. He, he was incredible. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty tough. They called him a little general. He, he knew the uh, baseball, uh, baseball rule book backward and forward. So if there was a, a problem with an umpire or a call, he uh, would know the rule that was going to be in effect, and he would take it. He'd have the book in his back pocket. He'd go to the umpire at home plate and tell him, hey, this shouldn't have happened. That's the kind of guy, that's the kind of manager he was. Well, yeah, he's one of the few that, that really understood the rule. Uh, uh, Billy Martin was semi like that, but Billy Martin was, he was just confrontational all the time, right? Oh, he'd get right up in the umpire's face and spit on him, uh, spit or uh, – kick dirt on on their on their shoes or on the plate and he just he made a the umpire uncomfortable to the point where they had to throw him out of the games a lot of times he didn't swear at him or no profanity but he just aggravated umpires yeah there were a few like that earl weaver was like that um and uh the guy uh, you played for with the cubs leo leo uh leo was a different cat he, um, you know, he was, he, Leo really was old school. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. the 40s. Leo would get thrown out sometimes before the game started. <laughs> Augie Donatelli didn't like him. Shay Crawford didn't like him. And he used to send a Joy Malfitano up with the, with the starting lineup because if Leo went up there, he's going to get thrown out of the ball game. So Joy Malfitano most of the time, or Pete Reeser, took the starting lineup to the plate when, when the game started in Wrigley Field. Now, you know, you pitched a long time ago. You pitched in the 60s, 70s, and the early 80s. You never wanted to come out of a game. You, Gibson, Marischal, Drysdale, I mean, you gave the manager. What would Leo say to you when he wanted to pull you out? 
Well, if the game got deep enough into the eighth or the ninth, he would walk past me in the dugout, and he'd give me that smile. Oh, we're giving the bullpen a rest today. So I knew the game was going to go according to how I pitched. And if I could stay in the ball game, low-scoring game, if I was still winning the game, you know, three to two, one nothing, something like that. I stayed in the ball game, and, and a lot of times I got a complete uh, contest. Well, that's great. Uh, who did you like pitch? You know, you grew up. You you uh, played against Seaver, Marischal, Gibson, Drysdale. Um, you know, all these great guys. Um, who was your favorite to go up against? You, you knew you had to be on your A game, or else you were going to lose. Well, in our division was Pittsburgh. I got Doc Ellis quite a few times. Uh, Bob Gibson a lot with the Cardinals. So I knew the matchup well before the game even started, looking in the starting lineup or the day before in the paper. I knew that that lineup I was going to have to face and the pitcher uh, opposing me was going to be either, as I said, Doc Ellis or Bob Gibson. A lot of times uh, I never got Koufax. So the Dodgers, I always got Drysdale or I got Don Sutton. And Drysdale was, you know, Sandy was, you know, as we know, was was God. And Drysdale was just mean. He, you know, Willie Mays always tells the story that Drysdale, he knew he was going to get knocked down the first at bat every time he faced Drysdale. And then he just dusts himself off and let's play, you know. But yeah. that, was, that was Drysdale trying to get the inside of part of the plate. And with you, you had the slider that uh, um, every batter probably said every four-letter word they could think of when that came <laughs> across the plate, you know. Yeah, well, it, it, they pretty much knew. They're going to see maybe a fastball close, maybe inside, outside. But that slider was the pitch that I, I got a lot of right-handers and left-handers out with. That, you had you had that uh, almost like a Randy Johnson slider. It broke pretty good, didn't it? I had a good slider. It was really quick, eight to nine inches, uh, more like a cut pitch. Uh, but it worked effectively for me uh, for almost uh, 18, 19 years in the big leagues. Yeah, I know. 3,000 strikeouts that got you in the Hall of Fame. And um, do you think Leo could have met, you know, 69, you guys were riding high, and then all of a sudden the trip to New York and the cat and the whole bit, we all know about that. Do you think Leo could have managed you guys a little different in September? Um, because, you know, as you know, as an athlete, once you get on that slippery slope, it's hard to get off. Well, we had a, a, a basic lineup from Kessinger, Beckard, Williams, Sano, Banks, all the way down to Randy uh, generally hit eight, or maybe uh, Don Young hit eight, and then the pitcher. And it was a starting lineup that Leo loved to play, and he stuck with it. Unfortunately, uh, we had guys on the bench that could have played. Uh, Popovich, we had Gene Oliver, Nate Oliver. Uh, geez, we had Carmen Fanzone. We had so many different guys, but Leo stayed with the basic lineup. Do you think that was uh, that was part of the downfall that he didn't give his guys enough rest during the, that stretch drive? Because you know, playing in September, especially when you're in a pennant race, it's it's dragging. It it can it can wear you down. Uh, you know, the, I don't think the heat got to us because we played all day games in Chicago. But the starting lineup was something that possibly could have been changed from time to time. Kessinger played 150 games. Sano 150, 160. Randy Hunley one year caught 162 ball games. <laughs> Ernie would play 100 and 130 at the age of 38, 39 years old. So when you look at it, we stopped scoring runs, and that was the the nemesis. Uh, we was we averaged well before September five six runs a game, and then September showed up. We scored one or two. We hit into a lot of double plays. We just didn't score as many runs as, as we should have. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I remember that as a little kid watching that and, you know, everybody's cheering for the Mets and, and then you see, you know, Chase Stadium, the, the black cat walking across. What went through your mind when you saw that black cat? Was it like, oh, no, or get that damn thing out uh, of here? <laughs> you know, I, I lost a Seaver that night. Uh, I think the ground crew, and it wasn't a full-grown cat. It was a little like a kitten, maybe eight, ten months old. And instead of walking towards the, the, the Met dugout, it, it came towards the the visiting dugout, which the ground crew entered the field when they scraped the field right behind home plate. So somebody opened the door and tossed his little kitten out, and it walked right behind Ron Saddle. Billy Williams was the hitter, and, and, and Ronnie's in the on-deck circle, and the thing walked right behind him in front of the whole dugout. 
<laughs> yeah, because we everybody remembers that picture of Sano in the on deck circle, and he's kind of like looking back, like going, "Uh oh," <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's kind of a. It was a typical uh, one of those. What's going on here? <laughs> Well, that's the beauty of baseball. I mean, there's so many quirks in the beauty of the game. Back in the day, now the stadiums are a lot – they're not uh, symmetrical like they were with all the cookie cutters and stuff because you have the, you know, Camden Yard. Just We still have Fenway and Wrigley, and, you know, with all the weird angles and, and, and the ivy and the baskets. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just part of baseball lore, you know. Uh, we were there. We were saw it. Wh- who? Yeah, there's so many new parks now. Uh, you know, the, the new one in Milwaukee, new one in yeah. Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, the only really ballpark, I think it's a real ballpark, but they brought the fences and the plate up, is Chavez Ravine. That ballpark was uh, was 420 to center field, and the power alleys were 390, 395. Now they're 375, and balls are hit out of the ballpark so easy. It's incredible. Do you uh, – that, that leads me to my next question. What were your fa- – outside of Wrigley, because we know you had your, your slider that you, uh, you uh, used quite a bit, of, especially with the wind blowing out. Um, what were your favorite parts to pitch in as, 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 uh, on the road? Well, I, I enjoyed the Shea Stadium, pitching there. Uh, probably in, in the American League, uh, Old County Stadium, Milwaukee. Uh, I enjoyed pitching in, uh, in uh, Crosley Field, uh, the Old Crosley Field with Cincinnati, you know, that it, it just, to me, the dimension of the ballpark really didn't enter into the factor, but it's the guys you played against, certain home run hitters, Frank Robinson, Veda Pinson, uh, out in San Francisco, McCovey, Mays, Tim Ray Hart, uh, Davenport. You know, in, in Philly, you had Dick Allen, John Callison, Don Demeter, uh, geez, so many guys. That, and I can name a, a hundred guys that I enjoy pitching against, but it's the ballpark you had to be uh, concerned about, uh, sometimes the power alleys and down the line. Especially in, in Fenway Park, it's only 302 feet down the right field line. <laughs> no. Pesky's, Pesky's poles right there. So I a right hand hitter could curve that ball around if he didn't get around on the ball quick enough. I, I can imagine you on the mound and some little punch and Judy hitter hits a pop up and it's in the screen and you're like, really, dude? <laughs> You know, yeah, 300 feet, well, the little league field. Yeah, you know, uh, and I, I mentioned uh, about uh, a week ago, I had a reporter phone me. It's the 50th year they had the basket in Wrigley Field, the basket all the way around the outfield. Right. And I, I mentioned that Tommy Helms hit a home run off me, and he only hit one or two off me, one run in the basket. And this was when he just got traded to the Astros, and he tied a ball game up 2-2 by hitting a home run off me in the eighth inning. Did he say anything to you running the bases, or did he give you the look? No, you know, he didn't bring it up until we were teammates uh, in Boston. And I, I was traded to Boston in, in 76, and he came there in, in, the, in the 70s, late 70s. And he says, hey, Ferg, I remember you. I had a home run off you. I said, oh, yeah, right. Like one of 500 other guys, too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, matter of fact, my first ever Red Sox game, July 11th, 1976, you pitched for the Red Sox against Bill Singer, and you won 5-3. My first time at Fenway Park, I will, it's ingrained in my mind. I, it was like Halloween. Yeah. My mom and dad and my cousins went to see the Queen of England in a parade. I got the better of the deal. I went to the Red Sox game. <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those right. hot, humid days. You know all about that back east. And uh, you, you, you beat Bill Singer 5-3. Freddie Lynn hit a home run. Well, those are good, those are good games to, to know about because, you know, a lot of times you don't remember them all. But certain games that you did give up a, a home run or something. Opening day to Don Money, a home run, 1969. I remember that home run. <laughs> you remember the pitch you threw him? Yeah, I hung a slider. Oh, oh the, the, the middle Mixer of the plate. Doing one of these, the right? You hit it to left field, no doubter. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy probably gave you the look, right? Like, what was that? <laughs> well... And we got the dugout. He said, hey, don't hang one of those again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he used other words to that effect, too. Yeah, really. I said, hey, I'm not trying to hang it. Just didn't spin right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that okay. Um, you, we, we've talked about Dick Allen and Willie Mack and, and Mays. And who absolutely drove you nuts as a hitter? Who, who could you just – you'd rather not see him even in the lineup? Well, 
late in the game, probably, and I had to probably face Pittsburgh maybe five, six times. Uh, Clemente was tough. You might get about the first or second time when it came to the plate, but that third time might be a little tougher on you. But uh, he, he was a nemesis to a lot of right-handed pitchers. Uh, he was a bad ball hitter. He swung at pitches that were off the plate. And a lot of times my slider would be off the plate and hit a, a shot to right field past Glenn Becker at second base. So I didn't want him to pull the ball. I wanted to hit the ball the other way. Mm. What about um, – uh, let, let's talk superstar hitters. Who, whose number did you have? Like wh- 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 uh, whether it was Willie Mack or Stargell or, or, or Mays or any Heron, any of these guys. Who, do, who could you – you had your way with most of the time? Most Probably of the time. in the American League uh, – I got Joe Rudy out pretty good, uh, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando. Oh, cause, cause Oakland had spring training with us here in, the, in yeah. Arizona, so I knew their starting lineup. Uh, Camp Paneris would get his hits. He tried to punt a lot of times off me. And the Angels were out there in in uh, in, uh, in Arizona. So Rod Carew was tough. So was uh, Harmon Killebrew. A lot of times Tony Oliva. Wow. Yeah, th- th- these are some great hitters. You know, I mean, uh, you, you, what do you think in today's game? Say you were a 24-year-old pitcher with any team you want, the Cubs or, or the, the Rangers or whoever, or the Yankees or the Dodgers, what do you think your contract would be? Just just a ballpark number. Because I remember a, a story you told me about Sandy. Well, you know, Sandy and Drysdale held out for 100000 Yeah. Until they got it. But, you know, nowadays, if you're a 20-game winner, you're looking at $10, 15000000 million a year. And I did it seven times, but uh, I didn't do it until I was 23 years old. So I did it. By the time I was 24, I'd won I'd won 20 games twice. So I might be looking at a good 10 million, 15 million dollar contract. That'd be a nice payday. You told oh, me. Yeah, time, sure. you, oh yeah. I don't know if you remember this. You and, and I were having a beer one night. dollars is a good contract. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You and I were having a beer one night, and I. I I said to you, what do you think Sandy would make nowadays? You looked at me deadpan and said, no team could pay him enough. Oh, I mean, some of the guys, Marichal, yeah. Perry, Seaver, uh, Palmer, teams couldn't afford him. No. And they couldn't afford big hitters like Dick Allen, Willie Mays, McCovey, uh, Al Kaline. They couldn't afford these guys because they'd have to turn the bankroll over to them. I mean, they'd, they'd be part of the franchise. Exactly. I, I understand there's a beer named after you. You have, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Fergie, uh, I've got it written here. Uh, you've got some sort of Pilsner out there. Is there a Fer- Fergie classic Pilsner? Somebody sent me a picture of that. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> now you do. <laughs> I'll send you the photo. I'll, 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 All right. I'll, I'll, Sounds I'll good. You. Um, it, let's talk about your foundation. Your Fergie well, we started the foundation uh, in Canada in 94. And I've had it well over 20 plus years. And uh, we support, uh, first of all, it's for the Red Cross, for our golf, out, golf outings. And then I supported cancer research. My mother died of cancer. And the Canadian Institute for the Blind, uh, medical dogs, sight dogs, that type of thing, and Special Olympics. Uh, so many different charities that we have supported over the years. Uh, well, I can't name them all, but there's been quite a few. And we, we basically do a lot of supporting in spring training and with golf outings. You, uh, you are the first Canadian in the Baseball Hall of Fame. You get to welcome uh, one of your countrymen, uh, well, obviously next year, uh, Larry Walker. And I think it's way overdue for Walker. That guy could hit. He could rake. Oh, yeah. He had a, he had a great career. He started, signed originally with Montreal and went to uh, basically to, to uh, Colorado. And he hit uh, really, really well out there. Even though they have the light air, he won a couple of batting titles. He won a home run uh, title, I think, too. But, uh, and he was an awesome right fielder. I mean, he played defensive with, uh, with anybody. I mean, uh, when he got traded later on to the Cardinals, he played right field for them. Great defensive outfielder. I'm not sure of his batting average, but he did help them uh, get into the playoffs one year. Yeah, he was in the 04 World Series, when, and which uh, to me was the greatest thing in the world. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it, they, that, that Cardinals team with him and they had Jim Edmonds and they had uh, uh, Pujols, they had, some, they had some meat in that lineup. That would be a scary lineup to face. Yeah, they had a, their, their power was uh, to, the, to the right side of the infield. So uh, I think because of the fact that uh, they had a real good lineup, uh, 
he was one of those cogs that if you had to pitch to him, you had to be very careful. You pitched, obviously, you, you, you played a, a little bit of your career at Fenway and Wrigley. What do you think of the upgrades in both places? Of course, we knew Fenway, they both needed it. They were in need of uh, the makeover because uh, they, had, they had issues, especially the clubhouse at Wrigley. Well, both ballparks have added uh, right field seats. You know, on the top of the wall there in Fenway, they've added another maybe uh, five, 600 seats. Uh, to right field, they've added more seats. Ridley Field constructed a whole new outfield. Basically, the bleachers, they added almost 3,000 seats. Jeez. So when you look at Ridley Field now, it probably holds 44,000. At one time, maybe close to 40, 40, 41,000 fans. Now it's well over. Standing room is like 45,000 people. Wow, that's crazy. And, um, and they sell out every game. I know. It, it, does does the, the do, do the new scoreboards cut down the wind at all? Because we know the winds at, at Wrigley are legendary. You know, I mean, if the wind's blowing out, you're like, oh, my arm hurts today, you know. <laughs> well, a lot of guys don't like the pitch in, in Wrigley, but you can't do much about the, the elements. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that's going to happen. Uh, the wind blows in earlier in the year, April, and in May shows up, June, July, and August, the wind blows out or across. So you got to pitch accordingly to, uh, to the wind factor, but it, it's something that happens, and you can't do much about it. Well, see, it, to me, you have the mindset, no matter where you pitch, I'm going to pitch. I don't care if the wind's blowing out. I don't care if, if, if you know, it's Fenway Park. I'm going to pitch my game, and I'm going to get these guys out. You know, I, I just think that uh, – you got to judge according to uh, what teams you're playing, the opponent, and then the, the factor is basically the win. Connie Mack was small. Uh, I, I mentioned Crosby Field, uh, Kamensky Park. Uh, there's certain ballparks that you're going to have to understand how these hitters hit and judge accordingly then try to pitch to your strength. Right, exactly, exactly. You want to get the hitters out with your pitch, you know. But, it, of course, like you say, you're going to make a mistake every once in a while. And if, if it's somebody like uh, McCovey or Stargill or Clemente, they're not going to miss it, you know, because they, they know they're going to get one cookie a game and they better do something with it, you know, because most of the time they're, they're going to get pitches they can't. They're not going to be able to do anything with it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, baseball it hasn't changed a lot. Uh, the ball is still fired up, I think. The yeah, ball travels think. a long way. The brand new bats. Uh, at one time, there was only two bat companies: Bill yeah. Richard Bradby and Adirondack. Now there's like ten or twelve bat companies, or maybe yeah. more. Yeah, uh, I mean, they make maple bats now that are splintered. If you jam a guy, the bats fly all over the place. Splinters. So you oh, you would have You would have loved that, Fergie, because you could have busted them inside more. You know. Oh more yeah, than once. I, I, I probably probably busted a lot of bats back then. You you may have had a might have had a bill from some of these hitters like hey dude you owe me some bats you know but um, yeah it's uh, you know the game has changed so much since you know you were pitching it's like now it's it's now a uh, you know if you're a starter five to six innings and I know that would have driven you crazy to, you know no I, I'm here to get 27 outs I ain't coming out of this game well yeah I mean uh, there was only nine pitchers made the staff. And now there's maybe 12 or 13. There's nine guys sitting out there in the bullpen waiting to get an opportunity to pitch. They, they have three or four holders, one or two especially guys, the holder, and then the closer. And it's just a, it's a totally different uh, scheme of pitching now. The manager can pick and choose who he wants to pull out of the bullpen. And they only want the pitcher to throw 100 pitches or maybe five or six innings. And then his day's done. That, that, that to me is crazy because, you know, growing up, you saw these guys and nobody ever wanted to come out of a game. I mean, if you were trying to take Gibson out of the game, you would get the look. You know what I mean? If the manager was yeah, going I mean, to the Complete games are not part of what the game's all about anymore. I you know. know. Some teams might have one or two complete ball games the whole season uh, because of the fact that the bullpen is so strong, the manager can pick and choose who he wants to pitch, and that's how games are played nowadays. Let's go through Hall of Fame weekend. What's it like for you? You've been inducted. It's like um, um, I've talked to Idelson about this and, and a few people in, in, that I, I deal with at Cooperstown. And 
Um, tell everybody what it's like, because a lot of people think it's just like Saturday and Sunday, but that's not true because you got the golf tournament and you have the, uh, the uh, dinner, which uh, I've heard is, is pretty fun. Well, it all starts uh, basically on Friday. You get there, Jane Clark has her dinner at her property, and, and all the Hall of Famers try to participate in that. Then Sunday and Saturday, you can play golf. Uh, Saturday night is the parade to the Hall of Fame, and you're basically invited into the Hall of Fame, and you walk around. It's like a, a cocktail party, basically, where they serve hors d'oeuvres, and you walk around in the plaque room. You've got your family there or friends. And you stand in front of your plaque a lot of times. A lot of picture taking. And then the, the ceremony is uh, basically Sunday afternoon. It starts about 1 o'clock. And all the new inductees are paraded in. And they have their speeches. It can be more than 15 to 20 to, to 30 minutes. And then the, the day is done. You fly home on Monday. Does it still seem surreal that you, being the first Canadian in Cooperstown, is it still kind of like, wow, that's me on that plaque in the Hall of Plaques? Do you still get that that excitement when you see your plaque in there? Well, you know, the nice thing about it is there's so many other great uh, players that have got their plaques. I've stood in front of, of uh, Joe DiMaggio's, uh, uh, Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, uh, so many of those Hall of Famers that came before me, Luke Schneider. Uh, these guys were incredible, incredible ball players, and to to know that you're part of that baseball Hall of Fame, uh, I'm pretty proud of that. I would be too, Fergie. I mean, you deserved it. Uh, you 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 know they the, the term warrior and workhorse. They could put your picture up there because you didn't want to come out of a game. You never got hurt, uh, or hardly ever got hurt, and you just you know. I mean, there obviously is a pitcher you're not going to have your, your good stuff one day and you know, you're not going to last five innings, but you give it your all anyways to try and get as many guys out as you can, but you know, Hey, my, I just don't have it today. And, uh, you know, well, you know, you know, what's nice. Uh, the class that I went into with, uh, in 91, the Rod Carew won uh, seven batting titles. Gaylord Perry won 300 games. We both won Gaylord and I both won hundred games in each league. There's only been five players do that in all of baseball. And Gaylord and I are one of the five. So that's a, a, a great distinction. Uh, winning 20 games was a lot of fun, too. And just playing uh, 18 and almost 19 years in the big leagues because of the fact that I stayed healthy, played with four organizations, which I really enjoyed playing for. And baseball was fun back then. And even though we didn't make the money that these guys made, it was only 16 teams when I signed. Now there's 30. So there's been a lot of new things happen in the game, and I've been proud to have been part of it. You, Yeah, because when you were playing, like you said, there was so few teams. You knew just about everybody on every team, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you had to know the lineups from day to day and the teams you were playing against. That was kind of the, the nice thing about doing your homework, knowing who you're going to face, what teams – and, and you're going to play a day game or a night game, or you might see them in a doubleheader. So that was the fun part of knowing the ball club you're playing against. And pitchers don't chart anymore. Like, you, you, you know, when you were coming up and when you played, you know, you, your next start, you were charting the guys, you know, and, and sitting in the dugout. Now they use analytics and stats and everything. And it's just – it takes away – for me, it takes away a little bit from the game, you know, because, you know, I've been following the game since I was five years old. And it's just – you know, this analytics, kind of, for me, I'm not big on it. You know, all the stats, you know, okay, we got to bring this guy in to face this hitter, and then we'll bring this guy in for this guy. It's just overuse, I think. I know that why they do it, but it just takes away a lot from the game. Oh, yeah, I think the thing that would have really helped me, and, and, and I would have probably enjoyed it, watching yourself pitch against certain ball clubs a week prior. Yes. And knowing the starting lineup that you play, you're facing. Or – Knowing a month from now, that team is going to have that same lineup. Uh, when you did the chart, it was all done in pencil. Yep. Small diamond. And you had a chance to look at it from time to time. But knowing and seeing it live on the screen would have probably helped me even more. 
what okay let's let's do a, a for example here um okay let's say uh henry aaron is at bat wrigley field it's uh, uh you're leading three to two uh two outs top of the ninth there's uh two runners on the wind is blowing out how are you going to pitch the the hammer well i'm not going to give him anything really good to hit i might even, if there's a base open i might try to pitch around him or load the bases up the next hitter is rico cardi i'm pretty sure so yeah. another good right-handed hitter uh you know what's nice i got hank out because he hit a lot of ground balls i think in his 700 and some home runs he hit he only hit two off me. The old Turner Park, he hit one and one in Wrigley Field off me. So wow. I was fortunate enough to uh, to get him out or he got himself out. Uh, I, you know, I would hate to have pitched around him to have to pitch to either Torrey back then, which was, which was Milwaukee and also with with uh, Atlanta, or uh, Rico Cardi. So I had to take my poison either way with right-handed hitters. And then they had then they had Eddie Matthews, the left-handed power. Well, yeah, Eddie was on that ball club too. So <laughs> there was always something that was going to be disturbing happen if you had to pitch <laughs> a head around Hank. You had to face somebody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, back in the day, that the, they had a lot a lot of teams like the Braves had a ton of power. You guys had had it with the Cubs with Billy and Ernie. And, um, you know, and then there was the pitching teams like the Mets and the Dodgers, you know, where you knew, like, like uh, you know, when you were, you were, you were going to play the Dodgers, you knew you were going to get Drysdale, Kopax, and Osteen every, almost every time they came into town or you came into L.A. And you knew it was going to be a low-scoring game. Well, you know, I, was, uh, you know, I knew I was going to have to face a uh, switch-hitting lineup from uh, Maury Wills, Junior Gilliam, uh, fairly hit the left-handed. Then I had the Davis brothers, Tommy and Willie Davis. Uh, Roseboro was the catcher. So there was always somebody uh, that you had to know how you were going to face them, how you were going to get them out. And, and the Dodgers threw a left-handed hitting ball club at me a lot of times. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, that, did, did that alter your pitch pattern at all if they were, you know, mostly left-handed? Well, mm -hmm. not really. I knew I was going to have to throw a lot of good sliders down and in or back toward them, you know, back dooring, a back door slider was just a, as effective as the slider down and in because of the fact that they gave up on the pitch because it's away, and then I had to break. So a lot of times that back door slider really helped me. Yeah, and like I said, we, we've said you played in a different era than it is today. I mean, you know, today half these guys, you don't even know who they are. But back then you knew what you, were, you had to do in a game situation, whether you're facing the Pirates or the Phillies or whoever. And uh, does it uh, – now, you share your retired number with, uh, with the professor, Mad Dog. Uh, that, that's got to be – Greg Maddox, uh, I yeah. think he wore it in Wrigley Field quite a few times. So, I mean, he was one heck of a pitcher. He left the Cubs, went to Atlanta, won a, quite a few Cy Youngs. He ended up, I think he pitched uh, 22 years in the big leagues. Yeah, and he had that. He had the the change up that just drove everybody, gave everybody fits because you know it was going like this outside the zone. By the time the game was over, the pitch was out here and home plate's right here, and he's getting strike calls. You know, he had a good fastball that came back, which really helped him. You know, he had a lot of movement. He didn't throw quite that hard, but he had a lot of movement, which is uh, very important uh, back then. Guys gave up on pitches. You couldn't give up on a pitch, uh, especially if a guy had good control which he did. He didn't walk a lot of people, you know. So, I mean, that's important. Uh, not giving up a lot of walks, staying in the in your pitcher's count, and, and staying away from home run hitters. Now, you you didn't walk anybody. You know, it, it, it must have irritated you to walk somebody, you know, if, if you missed on pitches. You know, to give a guy a free base. Unless, you know, we were talking, you want to you pitch around Hank and get him on first because, you, you know, you didn't want him driving in the winning run. Well, that helped, you know, staying ahead of the hitter, making them swing the bat, which is very important. Uh, you walk people, and pretty soon you're going to make a mistake. Now there's a double hit. Now you got second and third with one or nobody out, and you got to face maybe the middle of the lineup. So I think if you could throw strikes, make the hitter do part of the work, I think that really helps you out. That does. Now, a couple more questions, and I'm going to let you go for it, because I know it's getting a little All late right. here in, in, uh, in uh, Dallas, or outside of Dallas. Um, your mom, now, she was, she, she was blind, correct? Correct, yeah. She had glaucoma. She lost her sight when she was very young, in her 20s. And then I was born, 
which uh, I think in, in some cases helped her because when as a kid growing up, I used to try to uh, show her certain things. And she knew uh, because of the fact that she wore a white cane, tapping it in the house, what chairs were in or out. And I think that was a guidance for her. But uh, I look back at when I had a chance to pitch, she came to ballparks. I've told a lot of reporters, when she came and she was in Wrigley Field in Cincinnati, I never lost the ball game. So your mom was your good luck charm and she would listen to she the was, She was a good luck charm for me. Okay, now, if, if you're, let's go back from, let's say 19, 1960 to today. Give me two pitchers you would you would sit you would pay good money to go see. Well, she was there for opening day in 1967 when I beat Jim Bunny four to two opening day uh, against the Phillies. So, I, as I said before, she was a good luck charm. My dad uh, uh, was an inspiration to me. Also, he got me into the game. He enjoyed watching me play. And uh, when we got it, when I got inducted in the Hall of Fame, I said, "Dad, we got inducted together." Because he played the Negro League for, for about four or five years. That's, and you also played with the Harlem Globetrotters for a little bit, correct? Yes, I did. I played uh, three seasons with Metal Lark, Curly, Jackie Jackson, Mel Davis, Leon Hilliard. Uh, so many guys that, uh, that were the, the original Globetrotters that uh, I had an opportunity to play with them. That must have been a lot of fun. It was. It was, it was enjoyable. Uh, different cities that played in. I played in... Uh, San Francisco, the Checker Dome, in St. Louis, uh, played in uh, Madison Square Garden in New York, uh, the old uh, ballpark, uh, excuse me, uh, the old stadium in uh, in uh, Detroit uh, where the Red Wings played. Oh, the so Olympic. when I look back, uh, I had a lot of fun playing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember this. We, we, um, uh, we were having breakfast in Vegas one time at an autograph show and you and I and, and my wife are sitting there and Gordy Howe is sitting two seats over and you're like, Gordy, come on over. And my wife tells the story. She said, Bob, you were like a little kid in the candy store. And, uh, you know, you, I know you, you knew Gordy pretty well. And, and, and Gordy was a hell of a baseball player. He could have been a good baseball player. Yeah. Hey, Gordy uh, was a left-hand hitter and uh, he enjoyed playing. I mean, uh, in the off season, he played a lot of softball, but, uh, he was a very good athlete. So when you look at guys that were able to, to play that long in their chosen sport, and Gordy played something like 25 years as a hockey player. But he played a lot of off-season baseball. But he enjoyed uh, uh, baseball, I think, as much as he did hockey. They didn't uh, – uh, people don't really know. You played hockey as a kid growing up in Chatham. I played a lot of hockey. I stopped playing when I was 17 when the Phillies uh, decided uh, they were going to sign me. They wanted me to show up healthy. That the one year I, I got racked up pretty good. I had a hip operation. Oof. Uh, uh, I got a contusion on my hip uh, being racked up because we had wooden boards back then. Oh, yeah. They weren't uh, reliable like fiberglass like they are now. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, like you were mentioning the old Olympia, I actually got in there before they tore it down. And I was like, you know, it, it's like uh, I've told these stories before. That music playing in my head and I could see Gordy going down the ice. Of course, it was a dilapidated falling down building. But, you, you know, it was like uh, when you got me my media pass when you were coach for the Cubs, uh, I was wandering around the outfield and you and Billy Williams were in the dugout. And you, I looked back and you guys were kind of pointing at me and laughing. And you, you said, Bobby, you look like you're having a great time. And I said, Fergie, my friends would kill to be where I am right now. It's, you know, it's that, that's, that's the joy of sports. And um, being able to go to places that uh, you, you know, you often dream about going to. And I do have to thank you for that. That was, you know, one of the, that was a lot of fun back in the nineties well, when we had hair. Yeah, it, it was enjoyable. I mean, back, you know, back then, I think the opportunity to, to bring a friend into the dugout or on the field was something that was easily done. Nowadays, it's like taboo. Can't exactly. Exactly. Fergie, this has been great. I know you've got things to do. Uh, I would love to do this again in a month or two and maybe have you tell some of your stories that uh, we can tell on the air, uh, like the uh, Fergosi story and the bottle of the orange juice. You remember that when you told me it, when right. you were pitching with the Rangers. Let's leave it at that. We'll, we'll keep people in suspense. And Ferg, as always, good to see you, my friend. Uh, hopefully we get to, um, once this virus is done, uh, We'll, we'll hook up in the near future and go out and have a beer or something like that. Uh, sure, we can do it again. 
All right, Bobby, you take care of yourself. You too, Ferg. Take care, All buddy. Right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.